Hello. I was going to say one last time, but we actually have one more lecture after this. This is lecture 24 for Safety 380, Intro to Occupational Safety and Health. Today I'm going to talk about behavioral-based safety. So we're, we've pretty much completed the journey of discussing occupational safety and health from a, a compliance perspective, though I've been sprinkling in uh, things that go above and beyond compliance. Um, BBS is not part of compliance, but it is a, uh, it's something that's pretty much ingrained now in the, uh, the toolkit of any safety professional. And so I wanted to cover it. Um, also, there's, there's only one more lecture for this class. Um, and it's, uh, it's not one that you'll be tested on. It's more of a uh, reflection, contemplation, um, uh, about the safety field, things that I've been working on, things I've been talking to. And uh, so it, it's, it's more of just a wrap up um, before the end of the class. So you, uh, you, if you haven't already, please uh, work on and complete your semester project. You either will be completing the OSHA hazard identification training modules and submitting your experience and your, your, your scores from that, or you've selected a topic that I've approved and you're going to research it and report on it from a practical or applied perspective. I want you to take sort of the, the compliance approach to things and, and apply it to the real world. I've been trying to lead you up to that point throughout the semester. And then there'll be a take home, a take home, where you're already home, uh, a self-administered uh, final exam that uh, should take several hours because it's actually things that you would, questions you would be asked or things you would do as a safety professional, at least early in your career. So I'm gonna talk about some of the uh, pros and cons, kind of describe BBS. I'm gonna talk about some of the uh, experts in the field and talk about some other resources. Please read chapter 28. I've also posted some really cool videos for you. Uh, two, one is with Scott Geller, another is um, Dan Pink's uh, drive presentation that's been modified by um, by an animation group and then um, the optional one is Dr. Um, DJ Moran uh, who I consider a friend um, mentor and um, he did a presentation at Whitewater a few years ago and so provided that that one's longer so that's why it's optional the idea of behavioral based safety is predicated on things something that happened about almost over 100 years ago, and that is, you might you guys remember talking about Heinrich? Uh, really, at the beginning of the semester, he had the 88-10-2 ratio. I've got a picture of it here on the right that he views. Uh, he broke down and, and studied like 15 or 20,000, I think it's 10 or 15,000 accident reports, and labeled the primary cause as unsafe acts. And so in the, I'd say probably the, Mid 70s into the 80s, 1980s, uh, social psychologists, um, behavioral psychologists, uh, organizational psychologists um, started identifying what could we do to modify human behavior, and they, what they what they what they realized is that if we if we have if we train supervisors to identify unsafe behaviors and then have them intercede and use it as a teaching moment, that that will, in a way, over time, reduce the number of unsafe behaviors, therefore reducing the number of injuries. One of the earliest forms of this was called the DuPont STOP program. Uh, I don't remember what the acronym stood for, but basically what the, the story was is that in order for DuPont chemical plants not to blow up, they made executives move their homes and families right next to the plants. And so they felt more vested or something like that. So the basic idea is that see a worker doing something unsafe and go talk to them. Don't just let it happen. Um, and that should extinguish certain types of behaviors. Now, if we're going to talk about behavioral extension, we got to talk about B.F. Skinner. He had the ABC behavioral model, which basically means if there's a behavior you don't want, and the consequence itself is not enough for the person to learn that it's the wrong thing to do, you have to force a, an antecedent to mitigate, to extinguish that particular behavior. And so that's the basic idea. And that, that's where the observation and documentation and then the um, intersection and training go. 
There's also, I, I personally like the human performance model, which is also called the perceptual motorcycle. I learned this from my mentor in grad school, that as humans, what we're constantly doing is sensing our environment, perceiving what that data means. And if it's perceived as important, we think about it. So, you know, is it important? Is it, does it contribute to the pursuit of a particular short-term goal or what we're working on? And then, then how are we going to act based on that information? And then the feedback is like the consequence. We, you know, either we were confirmed in what we thought was going to happen, or it was violated. And then we we tried to either relearn or do something different. And I, th I think this is a great way to think about the way we're constantly interacting with our environment and how it leads to internal decision making and ultimately actions, uh, because. If there's a if there's a um, an issue not an issue if there's a lapse or error in any one of those steps something bad can happen outside the intent outside of the intent of the individual. Uh, also, what we want to consider is human decision making. I've got that on the screen too. There's utility base, which is actually thinking something through, collecting and understanding data which we rarely have time or access to. And then there's heuristics or satisfactory level. And that's how we typically operate. You know, throughout a day, you know, how many times do you make a decision which you really work hard to get the right answer? Probably not that many because not many of the questions are that critical or the answers aren't that detrimental to, to ourselves or could cause harm. Um, I always give the example that uh, when my wife and I were planning to build a home, I created a spreadsheet and rubrics and we did a double blind. She chose hers, I chose mine, she chose her reasons, I chose mine. And then we brought them together and we picked the best plan. Um, so a lot of data and analysis went into that selection, but it's also something you're going to invest a tremendous amount of money in and you're going to live there. And so it totally worked. I mean, we were really happy with the outcome. Um, I would hope that more of you would do this with uh, relationships, you know, before you pop the proverbial question, uh, really think it through. Uh, I'm not going to give you relationship advice here. <laughs> I should, but I won't. Uh, so most of our decisions are heuristics. And if that's the way humans tend to think, then we also need to understand that if we're going to say, okay, let's just give them safety training, expect them to do the right thing, they're making decisions based on heuristics then our training needs to be aligned with the decision-making that is predominant. Sometimes I, you know, what is the rule of thumb or uh, what is the default setting for, for, the, for the people you're training? The last thing on the screen is James Reason's Human Error. Uh, James Reason's work was based on uh, Bandura's work. Today, the error expert is probably Sidney Decker out of Australia. But the idea is what can we do to allow humans, or I'll say in this case, workers, fail safe. They can make a mistake, but that mistake does not result in harm, injury, or losses. And that's what the goal is. And now you know, there's this new approach called HOP, Human Organizational Performance. If you're going into safety, you're gonna hear a lot about it. If you're going into management, you'll probably hear about it too. It's somewhat new. Uh, Sidney Decker is attached to it more readily as Dr. Todd Coughlin. He tries to design for resiliency and for, to, for things to fail safe or fail unharmed. Uh, there's a whole group out there. And if you or know anybody who works for GE Medical, they're one of the innovative organizations for HOP. And it seems to be having some fantastic results. Uh, but it is very new. We're still trying to understand it. Well, no, they understand it. We just don't, we haven't fully tested it, I should say. When I was in graduate school, the reason I went to graduate school was to understand the psychosocial, you know, the organizational um, contributions to human behavior and safety. And one of the things that really, these are things that caught my eye and I think are really important to understand. And that is first, Adam's equity theory. Faraday's pay for Faraday's work. You've probably heard of that. You didn't know it was from Adam and... Um, well, you probably didn't know it came out in 1963. What, what we probably use more today would be um, organizational justice, which is an expansion of the original equity theory to three factors. So instead of just being fair pay, fair days pay for fair days work, which is really uh, distributive justice. There's also procedural justice. You know, is the system you know fair to everybody, or does it you know 
discount some, promote others. The other is interactional justice. Are people, you know, are the interactions fair? All these things, all this idea of fairness, um, justice, I think really drives human behavior. Uh, let me give you an example. One of my first jobs out of college, uh, six months in, I was loving the job. I really got into safety. I was learning as much. I was absolutely loving. It's been a great time. So the performance goals that were set in front of me I blew them away. It wasn't even a thing to me. I was just like, I want to get on the field. I want to try this. I want to try that. I want to learn more. The guy who was hired with me, two of us, took it because it was an opening. It was a bad job market. Hated what he did. So he just barely made the minimum. And they met with both of us for a performance review. And we both got the same promotion, the same raise. Here I am, innovating, excited. I want to take this places. He can't wait to get another job and we still got the same promotion. So if I wasn't so engaged in the job and receiving immense intrinsic satisfaction from the job, I would have been demotivated. And so, you know, we got to look in the work environment that people, workers are looking at each other and looking at their performance and looking at the um, the assessment or response that management gives to them. And if we feel we've been treated unfairly, we seek justice to that unfairness. Give you another example. Um, you ever been driving down the road and someone cuts you off? And what is your immediate response? How do you feel? <sighs> they just cut me off. They, they either, oh, they slowed me down. They almost got me into an accident. And you want to respond. They didn't do it on purpose, likely. It was just they got in the way. Uh, but you feel that they did it on purpose and you want to correct them. <laughs> so that's what it really is. So I think that things like road rage and stuff like that, it's communication. It's a perceived injustice they're attempting to rectify through violence, unfortunately, which is a very aggressive form of communication. The next on the list is fundamental attribution error. It's something we're all, this is a default setting on humans that... You can see the little uh, diagram here. If we see someone get into an accident or commit an error, we blame them. We tend to blame them, thinking that they full well knew what the outcome would be, did it anyway, or they should have seen that coming. Whereas when we're the ones who get into the accident or commit the error, we can identify multiple external factors that led to it and it wasn't our fault. This is sometimes also called observer bias. In safety, it is hypercritical. And I'm saying this is, this is actually one of the things that I really push in one of my later classes is do not blame the worker, at least not initially. And I was just walking through a, a plant uh, and I have two former students actually working there, safety professionals. And just in chatting with them, they said, yeah, one of the most critical messages they learned or lessons they learned was don't blame the worker. And that under, getting to know workers and understanding what you can do to help them to get their job done, to get it done safely, and I always add on and hopefully elicit some satisfaction from the experience is the goal. And that's what we're really trying to do. So we have to fight the urge to blame and try to understand the factors that put the p person in the position to be exposed to the harm or exposed to the risk that resulted in injury. The thing is, those exposures don't always result in injury. Or harm so therefore there can be multiple exposures that never result in anything but still that's important information to know and so that's a heightened level of reporting um, sometimes we can have trained supervisors to observe those types of behaviors track them and then we can study those instances or study those events and try to prevent them from occurring in the future the, the last thing on this page is the theory of reciprocity and this is a very simple one uh, if you, if you demonstrate kindness to someone, they'll tend to exhibit kindness back, especially if it wasn't asked for or predicated by something else. Uh, this is a really good skill um, for human interaction. And I don't know if, you've, if anybody here understands what I'm talking about, but things that I try to do, back in the old days when we used to go to restaurants and go out and stuff like that, you know, when you, when you meet a customer service person, or public service person, whether it's person behind the counter um, or, the, or the server, be pleasant, say hi, get to know their name, give them a compliment and see what happens versus when you don't. They tend to return that kindness. Uh, sometimes you receive something in the mail and it's like a dollar bill or a quarter or a penny. 
nothing really of value, but by doing that, they get more response back. I learned that from my social inquiry classes in grad school. Uh, if you're going to do research with doctors, like medical doctors, give them a candy bar. Because they're usually hungry because they're so busy moving around. That little gesture of kindness tends to get them to sit down and take a survey for you. It's true. And then, opposingly, um, if you treat someone without predication, ill-willed, or negatively, they tend to respond in kind. Just know that. So first impressions, right? Earlier versions of behavioral-based safety tended to have the blame built in. More recent versions of it do not. Uh, they're using it as a tracking mechanism, which I think is better. Uh, they're not attempting to fix based on the observation. And that's, that's what it really comes down to. And Scott Geller and actually his daughter, uh, Krista, um, they've really built this whole business idea on actively caring safety. And they're a great duo. Uh, and Scott Geller is one of the videos I'd like you to watch. He actually, in hearing him do a keynote at a conference when I was 22 years old, actually made me start thinking about going to graduate school at 22. And I had just gotten out of school and I did not want to go back. But he really influenced me. He's got a great message. This is something I teach in one of my later classes. It's the work system model. The, now, if you only try to fix things after people get hurt, then you're over on the right. That's the reactive safety. That's not an effective way to practice safety um, and mitigate uh, the costs associated with injuries. On the left is proactive. And so what we do is we try to remove the worker from the investigation or the root cause analysis of what can be done to fix it. The greater the discrepancy in the work system factors, the greater the likelihood of error being committed. Um, and so as an industrial engineer, trained as, as an industrial engineer, that's right in my wheelhouse. I, I try to study, you know, the work task itself, the, how the environment interacts, how maybe the standard operating procedure or job expectation may change due to the external factors and try to correct those things. But I try not to wait until someone gets hurt. And also, I would like to know when someone does something unsafe or they're exposed to an unsafe condition or even better yet, the worker is concerned about something. Document that, study that, and try to prevent things from happening. Here are the notable people here. And I mean, I should have, you know, DJ Moran on here and others. But Aubrey Daniels, you know, was doing this stuff back in the 70s. Tom Krause, I believe he's retired now. Um, he started, uh, I think it's Behavioral Science Technologies or BST, now bought out, now it's called DECRA. Scott Geller was a professor, at, I think he still is, a professor at Virginia Tech, and he started his own uh, safety performance solutions and people based safety. He's a good guy. Um, I got to have lunch with him a couple of years ago, he and his daughter. Uh, great message. He's so caring. And it's all predicated off of his earlier work with trying to get people to comply with seatbelts. <laughs> he built it into behavioral-based safety. Kind of cool. And then last and least, not least at all, was Terry McSween, uh, the president or the person who came up with Quality Safety Edge, and they've got a lot of behaviorals. And DECRA and uh, Quality Safety Edge, they, you know, their people go back and forth. So a real summary here is there is value in a behavioral-based safety as long as it eliminates blame, as long as it doesn't attempt to rely on the full correction at the time of observation and documentation, but attempts to go beyond what the worker's doing and what led the worker to what they're doing without blaming them. So that's all I'm going to say about that. Please read chapter 28. Study sheet will prepare you for the quiz. Congratulations. This was pretty much the last lecture um, for this class, last learned lecture, because the last one is more for entertainment purposes. Uh, but definitely, if you haven't begun your semester project, get on that. And the final exam is accumulation of everything you've done, but you could to, to use all your notes, use the book, use the internet, and don't hold back. Uh, that's the mistake we've had in the pack is that students give me like a, just a short answer. Don't. Really explain it because it's meant to be in a more of an applied type final exam. All right, zip. Uh, contact me if you have any questions. But this has been a lot of fun for me. I hope it's been fun for you. Hopefully some of the things that you learned or heard about in this class actually contribute to, you know, safety and health in your life, safety and health in your job. Um, but by all means, if you have any questions, please reach out to me. Thank you.